Hello, Rory McKiernan here, and you're very welcome to the Love and Courage podcast. A huge thanks, as always, to podcast patrons who chip in over at loveandcourage.org to support the podcast and to help it reach people in over 50 countries worldwide. Thanks to, to all of you who help spread the word in different ways. My guest in this episode is Eugene O'Brien. Eugene is a playwright, screenwriter, and former actor, originally from County Offaly in the Irish Midlands. He has written for the stage, for screen and for radio, and his work includes the critically acclaimed TV drama Pure Mule, winner of five IFTA awards, and which, according to the Irish Times, spectacularly raised the bar for Irish TV drama. And I do remember it fondly myself, and I would absolutely agree with that. It was an incredible piece of work, and we could do it a lot more like it back on the TV. The show was inspired by his play Eden, that's Pure Mule. It was inspired by his play Eden, which did debuted at the Abbey Theatre and since went on to the West End in London and also off Broadway in New York City. At the time of recording, Eugene is on the cusp of a creative wave with a new play called Heaven, film called Tarak and a new book, his first novel, which is called Going Back. Eugene is someone hugely dedicated to his craft and to the role of the artist in exploring ideas and understanding in society. And we covered this and so much more in this conversation. So without further ado, let's get going. Let's get started with the Love and Courage conversation with Eugene O'Brien. Eugene, you're very welcome to the Love and Courage podcast. You are a man that's in a particularly busy point in your life. Uh, you have a new book coming out. You have a film just out. And I think you have a play just coming out. Am I right? You're going for the Holy Trinity here. I, I'm going for the hat trick. Um, and uh yeah, it's, it's, it's great. It's just such a relief and a pleasure to have stuff going out into the world because, uh, you know, years can go by where you have nothing reaching the world. You have, you know, a lot of frustration and things nearly being made and things nearly happening. So it's just a great year where, by coincidence, just a lot of this stuff just seems to be happening at the same time. So it's fantastic. Do you ever sort of contemplate that? cyclical uh, sense of creativity where that the ebbs and the flows and you know why is it that time works in that order or does the mystery have to <laughs> remain a mystery oh I, I think it's a mystery it's it's look you know i'm pretty pretty good at working constantly you know like you're always at home you're always kind of writing you're always I'm, you know i've been at it you know about 20 years now so I kind of have learned how to discipline and be good and sit down and do all that kind of stuff. And then there's cycles of where, you know, you really feel things are going your way and your creativity is really good. And you, the projects seem to be going through all the various barriers that they have to go through and you're getting very excited. And then a lot of the time <laughs> they end up not being made or happening uh, and you have to gather yourself. So there's a kind of a new, there's a new kind of time where you have to, bolster yourself up a little bit and gird your loins again and go back up, go back out in into the world of trying to get stuff made. Do you know what I mean? It's it's you have to be uh, resilient, I suppose. You know what I mean? But but uh, which is not I'm not giving out or, or poor me or anything, because that's what the life you chose. But you sometimes you do have to. There is cycles of, of great opportunity and, and you seem to be getting somewhere. And then and then other times where you really have to gather yourself and go again. Mm. So a few years ago, things were not great. I remember it was the summertime 2017. I had two films that were going to be made. Both fell uh, within a month of each other on the final herlong, uh, furlong for the film board kind of dropped them and I was really kind of down so I really had to kind of gather myself and uh, the great theatre company called Pan Pan Theatre Company the kind of experimental doing very interesting work for many years and Gavin Quinn who's the director there and he offered me he said would you like to come and work with us on a project and I did and it kind of saved the summer it kind of invigorated me again and it was very creative you know it was it, they don't rely so much on story and narrative, which is kind of my, what I do, drama, you know, they do do another kind of thing. So things can come along sometimes out of nowhere and, and they give you a, a great boost. So I'm wondering about that sense of resilience that you mentioned, you know, because you said you, you kind of have to almost dust yourself down to some extent. And the thing is, like you, you do if you want to proceed and continue, but 
I suppose within that is the implicit choice of whether you do want to proceed, because I'm guessing that perhaps it's a, a bit of a rite of passage to some extent that to pursue a, a, an artistic path of any discipline that these junctures are somewhat inevitable, perhaps not always inevitable, and that it, these are the moments that perhaps separate the people that do continue from those that say, I can't withstand any more of this. Absolutely. There's there's many people I know, especially in the acting world, because I, I, I was an actor for 10 years before I kind of got into writing, but, you know, people have to make a decision about it, usually around their early 30s. Uh, am I going to continue or am I going to actually stop and really have, have tried to have a life and they want to have kids and they want to have more security? And it's a big it's a big question for people, you know, and the ones that do go on with it sometimes have to sacrifice things. I mean, I know a lot of actresses who, ha who haven't had kids because the time wasn't right and they were, you know, think, so you have to make uh, compromises sometimes, you know. Um, but uh, those of us who are kind of just useless and everything else have to keep going because <laughs> there's nothing else we could possibly do we are unemployable yeah so we've got to go and keep going but no i know i think that i had some somewhere even at quite low ebbs i had there was some kind of inner trust somewhere deep down yeah that i could keep going and something would happen you just have to keep going and 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 uh something would turn fair you know yeah do you have that sense of sort of vocational vocationality if that's a word it's kind of half vocation and half and half um job like it's i suppose some some stuff i write which is probably the most personal stuff to me is not there isn't that much money in it so that's vocational <laughs> you, can you can you give us an example of what you're talking about there well like i have a play that i've written that you know it's opening it's going into the theater festival and it's called Heaven. And it's a follow up to a play I did called Eden. And it's about a marriage uh, in the Midlands. Well, the man is from Limerick and the woman's from the Midlands and they're back home at her hometown at a wedding and their deepest, darkest desires and fears and big life changing moments have to happen over this weekend. But uh, I would make very little money from writing that. You know, like even if it look if it does really, 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 really well and goes on and runs in bigger theatres, you might make a few ball. But I would make very little. But it's very personal. It's very kind of um, it, and it's it, it's 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 straight from me to actors out. You know, film world is it's me. There's so many other people. It gets filtered down. You know what I mean? And then it has to be made. And then, uh, but this is a more direct line, and it's. It's uh, we've got two great actors. I'm really looking forward to it. So that's vocational. The and then it, it's a job. Then sometimes I will take like a job on, whereas a, a screenplay needs to be rewritten or so, uh, something like that. I'm doing less of that kind of stuff now. But and that's very much job. Clock in the clock in in the morning. Click ling, and then you do your thing, and then you you know. So there's a mixture of both things. So that being very personal to you, that type of work and and that thematic area, I suppose you know. Like, I was wondering how long it might take us till we mentioned the word the Midlands. But, you know, here we are at the juncture. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so the Midlands being a dominant theme in your work. But but secondly, I have this sense of like the, the, the secret Ireland or the shadowy Ireland or the not not so much the, the you know, the, the p political or religious secret sea, which of which there is plenty is plentiful. But um the intimate Ireland, that, that the emotional realm, I suppose, you're you're unpicking something, you're lifting a veil, or you're exploring, or maybe you you put it a different way. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think it's. I mean, I I've like in recent years, I I had written other stuff away from the Midlands, and but it either wasn't working as well, or you know, I just couldn't get it out there, or whatever. So I kind of found myself writing about the Midlands again. And um, whatever it is, that just seems to be the way I can explore stuff is in is in that part of the country. I don't know. What, I mean, I still go down there a lot. I visit, you know, I have family down there. Um, my mum and dad are still alive. They're down there, sisters and brothers and nieces and nephews. So I go down a lot. And it's it was always brilliant. Eating dairy, you see, it was an hour from Dublin. So it was far enough to be far enough away, but near enough that you could run home 
if you were in trouble, do you know? <laughs> so mm. it was kind of, but so I do go down there a lot and I, I would be pretty tuned into what's going on under the official Ireland. You know what I mean? Like it, it's, it's, you hear things, you, you see what's going on um, and you're able to look under that veil or the blanket and see, see what's really going on with people and really dramas or, or stories for me are all about that really it's about why we do what we do what we're uh, what what um what's really going on under the surface and and people being very stuck in cycles of things they can't quite move and then sometimes they'll move and sometimes they'll be stuck forever you know that seems to be a a, a theme really uh, all the time and i suppose i've been i've been working with a i haven't done that much at them but there's a great group Jerry called Acorn, and um, they do, um, they, they they essentially take kids in, teenagers who either come from backgrounds that aren't great, or they've had tragedy, or they're and they're, they can't stick school, you know, and they bring them in and they do a an alternative school for them, and it's a brilliant place, and I'm very friendly with the guy who runs it, Kevin Farrell, and we I did some work with them last year on a video about a spoken word thing. But, you, you know, that gives you a real window into another Ireland. Like, it's, a, it's like Kevin says, there's, there's Eaton Dairy, the town, and this is any town in Ireland. I'm not singling out Eaton Dairy. You know, there's the town, the official town. And if you just go off to a little side street, there's another town that's like a ghost town or like another parallel universe where people are gathering. And it's, it's, it's a lot of trauma and drug use and alcoholism and, you know, a lot, a lot of kind of that stuff going on. So there'd be, you know, you'd get, you'd get a, a real view of, 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 of that. And that, that certainly has influenced uh, stuff that I've written this year, you know, especially, especially in, in, in the, the book. And then my brother, how the play came about was my brother took me around the town about four years ago. He says, I, I want to take you around the town. Have a look around this fucking town. And uh, he just wanted to bring me down to all the places that had been boarded up and all the follies of the of the Celtic Tiger and all the nonsense. And and there's, there's a huge kind of scaffold uh, outline of a building that was supposed to be a, a, a hotel and a cinema and a big complex at this local... I, I better not mention him. Uh, but anyway, he... he um, was the real poster boy for the Celtic Tiger himself and the wife. And he bo- he borrowed all this crazy money and got everyone involved and people lost fortunes. And he, you know, it was just madness. Absolutely. And, but you could still see the folly of it there. It's still in the town, the, the, the stagnant uh, water in the underneath and the, and the, and the, um, the, the, the outline of this building, shell of this building that was never built, you know. Um, I think it's going to be a school now. They're going to do something with it. But... And um, so the, he just he just brought me around the town and all these different places. And, you know, we there was po- this, every nationality in the town. Uh, and he kind of pointed out that you know, the Chinese people, the Polish people and all that. But the, the really, they don't mix with the eat and dairy people and they very much stay at home. And it's, uh, their mission really is to earn money in the meat factory, send it home, go to Little, And they kind of it, it, it's all about saving money and, and sending it home would be what the perception would be, whether that's true or not, I don't know. So it doesn't really add to the town, you know? So these are truths that are, are opinions that are interesting to hear. You know, it's not it's not the official Ireland PC kind of version of everything. Do you know what I mean? It's interesting to get these other, what, what are people really thinking and what's really going on? But just the tour around the town influenced um the play, do you mean that? So I, you know, that the, the woman, I have a woman coming home, and her sister takes her around the town. That's the opening of the of the play, and um, boom, we're in then into the story. You know, yeah. So it's it's the the like I yeah I seem to be back in the Midlands, <laughs> and I did I didn't know I was trying to get away from them, but now I seem to be back there. But I'm glad to be back there. I suppose you're also um, speaking to the kind of ever evolving. Ireland as well in that like the place I grew up in is more border lands but at the same time it's almost geographically centre point north northerly centre in, in Cavan Monaghan region but um, I can very much identify with all those towns that you're talking about and like that the likes of Cavan or Monaghan now would be more ethnically diverse as one thing that has changed as well as having 
the internet as a major cultural change and on all these other influences. And I suppose, yeah, it's, it's probably hard for me to not get into a conversation on migration there just, you know, as a topic that, that you raised because I, I work in that area a few days a week. But it does speak to the kind of evolving nature of Ireland and, and Middle Ireland and in a way that the image of Ireland, when we think of these towns, we it, it might be a bit frozen in time, but also the points of tension that are there as well and points of friction. And I suppose like traditionally, that's an important place for art and artists to explore and platform a place for a uh, dialogue and understanding because like I'll be very honest with you you know <laughs> like my immediate reaction is to to rush to the defense of the whatever nationality it is <laughs> that that's in the meat factory because I I see how their rights are often infringed and so on and so forth and yeah yeah but the thing about the binary discussions that are saying all good and all bad is that we end up with no real discussion in the middle and the binary, the polarities get more polarized. Yeah, absolutely. And people don't feel they're being listened to or they don't feel they're being taken on board. So they get, yeah, they get that their position becomes more entrenched. And, you know, a lot of the time it's not anyone like it's, the people move in, but no one has asked anyone about their opinion, about what would, how would best would these people be able to be hosted in the town, or you know, I mean, people are just kind of you know shoved into places, and there doesn't seem to be that much discussion with any local groups about you know what could go, what could happen, and certainly, I mean, I know the meat factory people get a, I mean, the, I mean, the pandemic showed up how badly they were being treated, you know, and you see has in 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 town there, and I know this that that like you have. Like someone's making money out of them because there's about twenty five of them living in a house. Do you know what I mean? It's all of that. So, um, well, we we tend not to think of uh, meat factories in the context of oil industry and so on, but it's a, it's a multi billion barren type industry. Yeah, but yeah, anyway, we 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 could go down that other road. <laughs> yeah, I know, but uh, but it's it's. Um, I mean, I, I yeah, but it's in, it, it's good to just air what people are thinking or the two sides of the argument. Like there's a, there's a thing, but there's a, there is a, like in the play, there is a discussion about travelers that, um, and it, it is in, based on an incident that like, you know, that, that someone uh, like a, a publican was, was beaten um, or got a good whack and windows smashed and all that. And, you know, pubs will close down if there's a traveler funeral or a wedding indeed. Uh, and there has been lots of evidence, and I know this, to say I would close down my business because the evidence is that if they come in, there's a fucking war. So that's either unfair or not. I don't know, but but that's in one. It, it's a reality. Uh, now I have the other. I have someone defending the position for the you know saying that the barman should have served them and it was his prejudice. And if you keep denying people like that and keep treating them like shit, that anger is going to, you know, it's intergenerational anger. It's going to get kept carried on and people feel and they're going to lash out. And, you know, so there's a kind of a, there's, you hear the two arguments for both sides. But, um, but, you, it, but, it's, but you just want to try and go into these areas, you know, and now, it, now it's getting harder to do that in drama, uh, especially in drama and theatre, uh, because uh, it's harder to people think you're saying the wrong thing or you're not adopting the right party line on everything. Like we we're making, I'm, I'm doing another show at the moment, um, which is more of a, 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 a very different type of show, which is not written. It's, it's, we've improvised it and it's, it's very much a group making theater. It's like, the, it's like, it's, it's the way the young people are making theater nowadays, you know, it's not a script. And then you hand it to the director. It's, everyone in together in the room and it's brilliant and it's very creative and it's great. And I kind of put it together and shape it, but it's, and, um, but you know, the, but there is a, there is a generational divide between the younger people in the group who say, Oh, you can't do that. You can't say that you can't. And they're terrified of anything. I mean, I, I don't know how they're going to really to, to make art or whatever you'd like to say, uh, not to sound poncy, but if you're going to do anything like that, you have to be willing to, to to make people uncomfortable uh and it's just funny in the room some of the stuff is oh god we can't do that what do people think if oh you know it's about race 
because we because we have a a, a young lad, um, Kareem, who's um, we keep born here, but he did spend time in Sierra Leone and then he came back here and he's a med he's a, a pharmacist student and he's a rap and he's also a hip hip hop hip hop artist. But there was a whole thing about him. He's the only we have a a rap song at the beginning of the show. And it was a whole thing about, oh, we, you know, are we stereotyping black people because he's a black person doing rap? And anyways, it got into this whole minefield, you know. And then there was another scene where we're putting a little bit of black eye, eyeliner or makeup around another character. It's all about theatre and acting, the show. And people were very nervous about, oh, my God, there's a little bit of black paint going on his eyes where they think he's blacking up. You know, he's not. He's it's a theatre. He's putting makeup on his, you know, but just people are so terrified uh, of saying the wrong thing. And that's not good for making art. And we can only see I mean, there's two extremes. There, there, there was a show in Edinburgh recently, Jerry Sandovich, the Scottish comedian, who deliberately sets out to uh, annoy people. And his his show was cancelled in Eden Edinburgh, was taken off, which I think is deeply disturbing. You don't go to see him. If you're easily offended, you know he's there to offend you. You know, and he's doing it. It's working on a few levels. Like he's not Roy Chubby Brown. You know what I mean? He's he's actually trying to do something. But uh, I, I, I'm, I mean, Sam and Rusty was attacked the same week. Mm. And the two things are kind of similar. You don't have to read the Satanic Verses, and you don't have to go and see. You know. But anyway, we're into this. Uh, it's 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 just a troubling time, I think, for for art in general, be it drama or anything. You know. Yeah, I suppose there's an ongoing discussion and debate around how we usher and responsibly sort of have conversations. And I suppose that, that, that I, I use the word responsibly there because oftentimes the, the, the sort of demands for what, what is called free speech, the, the, the relationship or the correlation with what can also be classified as hate speech yeah, is is quite aligned, and and you and I might be able to argue the toss on, you know, the right to that view, but on the other end of the spectrum is, is this group of people that they're the ones impacted by the hate coming their way, not you and I, because we're the we're the white Irish lads that will be more or less grand. But I suppose there's this space in the middle that is getting chewed up, and. It's hard to get away from the fact that I don't want to get too stuck into a kind of a social media is all bad. You know, everything was fine before social media because it absolutely was not because they were lynching people in the United States and, and bombing people in the north and, you know, everywhere. But there's no doubt that the, the, the technology has been designed to enrage and inflame and, and it has merged into the the cultural zeitgeist so i suppose where does that leave us is is the bigger question you know and for you you feel that the space is closing uh, well I, I it's more i mean i i suppose i i would be maybe selfishly just kind of more because it's and it's well it's also about a space i know a little bit about it's just a creative space do you know what I mean uh that that it's it's getting harder to, or there's the danger that it's getting harder to really talk about stuff in a way that is possibly, that, that is that is slightly dangerous. I don't know. Do you know what I mean? And art, like good stuff has always been a little bit upsetting and a little bit, like if Lolita was back, you know, it's that, it is an old argument of Lolita, which is an astonishing book, that, that, that would not be published today. It would be. It, would, it wouldn't get out. It would not get out, and I don't think that. Like to to take on these issues and to see the full extent of how one could suffer from them, you have to go in. The, the best way, the more interesting way to for me is not to think about the victim from the victim's point of view, because that art is just going to be. Oh, it, it's very obvious. You know, you shouldn't be doing this to someone. The more interesting thing, but more uncomfortable, is to go into the mind of the per, the perpetrator of 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 the. Uh, well, he's he's a. I mean, he's a he's a pervert, you know, a Humbert Humbert, and so we get into his mind and his feelings and his, and that's very uneasy, but we but we understand 
I think we get a greater understanding of the whole area and actually a more horrific version of it than if it was from the victim's point of view. And at the moment, I see in a lot, especially a lot in theatre, it's all like theatre and education. It's all from the victim's point of view, which is great. And that's very good. I, that's stuff I would put into schools. I would think it's really valid. I think it's re- some of it's really well done. And it would be great for teenagers to see it. But for an ad, I see it in all, in ad, all, all theatres seem to have it. Do you know what I mean? Like it's, it's adults should have more challenging kind of stuff, I think is what I would make more interesting. Yeah. What, what I'm hearing from that is, you know, you, you talked about that discomfort that, you know, like I often reflect when I'm kind of turned on the radio, it's, I, I wouldn't be turned on the TV so much, but you turn on the radio, it's like the cultural zeitgeist is so banal it, it's like having the least nutritious food served to you constantly and the music is the lowest common denominator of of some kind of pop factory algorithm and maybe we're just getting older and grumpier too but we probably are i mean i, I always preface any of these yeah <laughs> well, well well that 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 certainly could be a consideration you know but um but but there there definitely have been times throughout history where music as another medium has challenged the establishment. Uh, but to make you uncomfortable, I'm just thinking of the Sex Pistols or something like that. Well, absolutely. The Pistols, like Ghost Town by the Specials was number one in 1981. And it was an extraordinarily political song reacting to the toxic riots or whatever, I mean, the riots that had happened in England in, in the, I mean, I'm, I don't hear any of that. It was number one. I mean, it was, uh, I'm not, seeing that at the moment maybe i'm just not looking around as much or i'm not as okay with it i'm talking about the pop charts like it probably is there but as in the music may be getting mad but it's certainly not allowed to get through into the mainstream like that's an ordinary would say, or you know not ordinary but, but like you know people who because the wonderful thing is is when people who are are not possibly encouraged in school or, you know, school isn't a big, or education isn't a big thing. And a lot of people saw stuff on TV or saw stuff that really sparked something off of them and made them think about stuff and made them actually, I mean, you know, people have told me about life-changing things that have happened to them just by watching TV. And it was almost, it was the tyranny of only having four channels. It was actually quite good in many ways because you had no choice but to watch what was coming in. Now that's the whole argument about what was being curated for you. And and that and you know that 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 was wrong as well because you you had these people deciding what you should watch. But actually, some of the stuff that was coming down the tube was was kind of brilliant, and people wouldn't have watched it if they'd had a choice. But when they watched it, they really liked it. Whereas now there's so much fucking choice, but it's all that Netflix, which I think is all the same now. I mean, it's it's very cleverly done. It's all I just find it has very little heart. It's all made by committee, very skillful committees. But there's no point of view, really. And it's very unpolitical. Like, there's no real attitude to anything. It is really all about plot twist and, you know, oh, your man's going to get killed and the dragon will come in. And, you know, so it's, it's and some of the stuff is absolutely brilliant. And, I'm not, you know, uh, God, uh, you know, I, I I admire a lot of it. But a lot of it I, I wouldn't really be watching. And, um, and, it then, and then it buries some very good stuff because people just can't get to it because there's so much choice, you know. But maybe I'm just, I don't know. Maybe you're just what? <laughs> Old <laughs> and bitter. I don't think so, though, actually. Well, it's a, it's certainly a good question to keep asking oneself to, to check in. Oh, to check in, absolutely. <laughs> Can we just kind of switch gear and rewind a little bit? I, I'm just wondering what kind of a child were you? <laughs> I was a little bastard. I was, that's a great question, actually. What kind of a child were you? You know, I was probably... I, I know I was bookish in terms of like that. I like at a very young age, I'd be uh, leaning over picture books and looking at things and all that. And uh, I, very probably away with the fairies a bit a lot of the time. I wasn't quiet, but I wasn't loud. I think, you know, I, I go in and out. I, I, I find that I'm like that anyway. I can be a very quiet person half the time and the other half, then I can be quite gregarious and go out and want to drink 25,000 pints and be, whoa, you know. And then a lot of me is quite doesn't want to do that at all and just wants to be kind of quiet and and uh, but I was always going to like I was always obsessed with books and stories and films and we had a cinema in the town which the family ha- owned 
So I used to go to the cinema every Saturday for those Saturday matinees. And I was obsessed with that. That was like a huge influence. And because we saw a range of films in those days, it was the 70s. So if they if the lads didn't have a Disney or a whatever to show, they'd show whatever they had in the box, like uh, from the Friday night. So you could see you saw all sorts of stuff that you shouldn't have been watching. You know, 500 kids at Sam Peckinpah's The Wild Bunch, you know, blood everywhere. And <laughs> and we were just in heaven, you know, and the, the bloodier it was, the more extraordinary we thought it was and but then we also loved the the uh disney's and we loved the you know the children's films as well but it was an incredible atmosphere in the place i oh i mean i still can feel it and taste it and smell it the those sweets and just the stink of everything and the all the children and the lamb the time forgot you know that with the with the foot the, the paper mache dinosaurs and but wondrous you know and uh, we would go home then and just play out the films. We never shot at each other, never competitive. It was all storytelling. It was all like, right, I'm going over there. I think the Comanche are over the other side of the hill. So I, we would just make up these stories that were um, that were just got from the cinema. So I was a goner, really. Like, I, I was always going to be making stories up, I think, or performing. You know, I performed as a kid as well. I used to like performing. Um, and doing voices and doing Colombo in the schoolyard or whatever, you know. More often than not in many parts of Ireland, perhaps not all, but many or most, the the 16 year old will or 15, 16, 17 year old will eventually end up in the pub to, to, or, or with with a flag and a cider mm. uh, vodka or whatever they're having or down the woods. Did that become part of this, you know, did, did this fantastical world merge into that at any point there? Um, well, the funny thing was that I I didn't really do that. I, I, I At 16, 17, I hadn't quite found the tribe or whatever you'd like to call it. So I, and I had great mates in the town and fellas I still are friendly with and, and, and they've moved away now. But I didn't really go out. I wasn't one of these young lads who went out early or was doing drinking loads and doing all that stuff. I, I was kind of watching movies. <laughs> like I was really, I was, I was kind of nerve. I, I, I was kind of anxious about going out. I, I don't know. I was, uh, but I, I used to be in the cinema all the time, watching the movies or, or, or hanging out with the cinema. Manager or In a sense, you were, you were geeking out. I was geeking and hiding probably, you know, uh, and then I went, I, I got into college, I went to communications around lines, and that was all, I found the lad, they, they, they were all like me, kind of, you know, they were, they, they, or a group of them, any were, were, were like me. And then I went mad. But um, no, I didn't. I mean, I didn't, but then I loved going out and socialising and uh, doing all that kind of stuff, you know. I suppose the, the drink bit, uh, you know, it, it, it certainly comes into play in a, a lot of your work. And it's interesting for me because... It, it certainly is a more, you know, it's often a catalyst for the veil, the lifting off the veil where your man has the revelation or the row or or the dark moment. And it, unfortunately, it, it does seem to go hand in hand with that the shadow side of Ireland. Perhaps it, you know, has been used to navigate. And, you know, I often see that the average small town, well, when I was growing up, my town had on something like 30 pubs a very small town and that wouldn't be uncommon but and a lot of that is great crack and entertainment and culture and music and and then there was another side of it that was really about medication yeah absolutely total medication and soothing you know just soothe trying to soothe whatever was going on or whatever trauma or lives unlived or you know and yeah, I mean, I've seen, I, I, I think, I mean, I've seen quite a lot of that. I, at the pub and the social thing is such a central thing in Ireland and many, you know, and it's great in many ways, but there is a, uh, but there is a, a huge, um, the way alcohol kind of runs through the society uh, without, you know, without, and you don't want to sound like a killjoy or a kind of, but it is, um, it's very controlling, you know, you can, you can get caught up on it. And I certainly would have, I think in my thirties was because I was I was I was acting and act, the acting life is very social because it's at night time you know 
you're coming off stage and you're oh it's all fucking hyped up and you're you know, you're drinking and then I, I had you know i had some success with the plays and suddenly i was the great lad around the town and the tv show came along and you know things were going really well and but i was quite anxious about it all i i found this the, the success was quite weird and i found it very anxious and whatever else was going on with me so i, w I was drinking quite a lot so i had to make a decision about that too you know i mean it came to a head kind of it was around 2007 and um i just said i'm gonna i just have to i'm gonna have to stop drinking how am i going to do that well if you tell someone you're going to do it then you maybe you'll have to do it so i said who do i tell okay i'll tell a counselor so i just made a decision to 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 i looked up the yellow pages like and said right What's a cancer that's near enough? So I just, it was almost pinning a tail in the, in the, the donkey, you know. And I went out to a place and uh, I met this very nice man in a room and it was all very light. And it wasn't like I was absolutely desperate, but I just, something in me felt I had to do something. And I talked about this to this man and it, it did help just to be talking to someone. And we didn't really go into huge deep areas or, you know, didn't, and it also just made me kind of stop. I, I just stopped drinking, stopped going out. And it was a big life change. Like it was a big, I had to really adapt because everything was built around drinking. All my friends were were uh, great drinkers, as we'd say in Ireland. You know, it was a great man to drink, great woman to drink. It's the only country in the world where you get praised for falling down a drink, you know. Uh, but it was weird. And I saw, I mean, the whole world was weird not drinking, you know, for, uh, for, and I would say, I, I mean, I'm back, I drink now again. I stopped for about 18, 19 months or something like that. But it was, I was very glad I did. And it would never had the same hold at all on me after that. I would think it was, just, and it was, it was interesting. So, so I can see. I mean, I, so that was a little bit of a scuffle I had with it or, a, you know, real experience of, of having to try to get off drink, uh, to, to not drink in Ireland. Like, it's very difficult. And I can't, like, I, I could go to the pub for a while. I could I could maybe do two hours. And then I was out of there. Like, I was gone by 11, you know. Mm. I could, like, and, and, and then got into the habit of being actually very delighted to go at 11 and delighted I was home. And delighted to be getting up lovely and fresh and you know is is there anything in there where you know this being your your trade your profession your vocation your craft your your income that in order to be serious about that obviously there's there's there are certain individuals seem to be able to pull off 24 7 lifestyles but they're few and far between and eventually someone's going to crash the car proverbially or, or, you know, metaphorically or otherwise. And, you know, is there that sense of having to be the professional if you're going to go the distance? Um, yeah, no, you have to you have to get into that. You you have to find a way of 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 writing, uh, you know, getting to the desk every day and doing all that stuff. I mean, the weird thing was when I was drinking quite a lot, I was finding time to write because I, I was there's a lot of stuff happening. And a lot of stuff was getting made, and um, but I, I I I wouldn't drink like I just wouldn't drink, and then I'd go at it hammer and tongs, and then I then I'd go drinking, and then I'd come back and go ha at it hammer and tongs. So it, it was kind of amazing. And then when I stopped drinking, things got amazingly the work dried up because in one way I was going, my God, I'd keep drinking, I'd be so creative, and everyone would want me, and it'd be fantastic. This would be the reward for not drinking. The opposite happened. A major kind of TV thing we were going to do that with, with RT that was a follow up to Pure Mule, and I had put a lot of stuff, heart and soul into it. And I really wanted it was a very personal thing, and we nearly got it done. And it 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 they they dropped it in 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 a certain time around two thousand and eight, and I was completely flummoxed by that, you know. And it took me a while to get over that actually, uh, but no worked <laughs> work kind of dried up. But in in terms of professionalism, I I think you know you you do have to look upon writing as as a it's a it's a real job. You have to go into the room and you have to be there at a certain time. I have a certain routine every day, and you have to you have to get that going. And it takes a while to get that going. You know, it took me a few years before I was really really good at that. And um, and then I'm finding that it's also important to stop writing and to have three or four months where you don't write. Um, 
you might have to do bits and pieces to keep yourself going and all that, but but that you're you're doing other things. Uh, I do a bit of mentoring, I do a bit of teaching, I do a bit of, and it's good to refresh the 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 the, the batteries. You know, and like the last few months, I I haven't been writing because I've been kind of busy enough, just um, getting the book finished and getting the play up and doing the, getting the film finished was was a big thing as well. And there's no harm in in in. I find variety is very good at writing. That you, you I, I write very a lot of different kind of things. And it just keeps you writing. You're not waiting too long because the film business, you go, go tired, bitter and, and really old uh, waiting for <laughs> films to be made. So you have to be doing loads of other things. And I just think that's the key to it. Um, and it's still hard to make a living at, really. I mean, I do OK, but, you know, you're always writing in the hope that you don't write for money anyway, really. I mean, if you want to make proper money, you do something else. But uh, no, th- things have been... I've, 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 there's a good balance at the moment anyway between everything in excavating these different worlds and different characters and, and that other Ireland is there a risk th- uh, there that you sort of can get lost in their worlds and I suppose what I'm interested in is how do you navigate your own interior world in relationship with these characters, like can can you go down a dark hole yourself, for instance, when you're hanging out with these characters? No, sorry, no. I think I think if 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 you're going down a dark hole with them, you you go down that you'd go you you go down the dark hole with them. But I think you're able to come back out the other side, and actually you feel a bit better having gone down there in a safe way <laughs> because it uh, it it is you know you you know you're making it up, you know. And you're drawing upon your own inner fears and things that are in you, plus other stories you've heard of other people, and you put them all together and you make things up. But uh, sometimes it's it's um, the more darker the thing you're writing, the more uh, you you go there very much, and then you you go out of it, and it it it's fine. It, what's harder actually is writing com- try, trying to be funny. Now, that's horrific, <laughs> but do you know what I mean? It, it's actually very stressful on the system trying to be trying to be funny. Uh, you feel very inadequate. You're, you're you feel you're being judged. You're being tested. Is that funny? Oh, I don't know. Um, we tried to write a comedy film a few years ago that we made uh, with Pat Short, and I found that really stressful. Whereas the darker stuff is is easier in a way. I mean, it's funnier. You you go you, you know you kind of you go there, and it's very personal to you, and you kind of know you know that it's real or you know that you know about it or something and and yeah yeah and 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 i've only started your new book and congratulations by the way it's it's an excellent piece of work um but i found that you know in whatever you might consider to be the darker sides it's loaded with a more natural humor anyway like the 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 comedy just bounces out of the dark yeah, no, and, and I'm comfortable, was more comfortable with that because I know I know the character very well. I know the world very well. I know this 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 the speech and the. I think it's it's easier to probably it's probably easier to write stuff, write comedy when you're when when the whole thing is not expected to be a comedy. Do you know what I mean? That it's just you're writing the truth or trying to get to the truth of the characters, and out of that stuff, comedy happens or a bit of fun happens or you know natural banter or whatever you know. But if you're trying to be funny, it can be. Uh, it it can often be not funny and <laughs> and also really stressful. Absolutely, in life in general. <laughs> in life in general, <laughs> do you know what I mean? Like if you're tr- put on the spot to be funny, I can never be funny. People say because I I can do voices of you know you know people say oh do you know on the spot and I can't do it. But if I'm in conversation and you know whatever we're having a band thing blah blah, blah I'll, I'll come out with it and everyone has you know it's all hilarious. But, but you know, if you ask me to do it, I can't do it. Well, you, you everyone's going to want to hear you doing a voice now. <laughs> I can't do one now. You see, <laughs> that's it. We'll record it later when when you're not looking or something. Yes. <laughs> so, in going back and the new book, do you feel like how much of that is is you going back? I mean, do 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 you separate yourself from from the character from the work in general? Like I. Are you, like it's it's this just constant sort of midlands, <laughs> um, you know? Are are you are you trying to resolve anything in yourself here? I suppose I am. I suppose you always are, even if you don't know you are. You know, mm. I mean, the act of 
like it's it's that old you know it's the old story of you know you come from somewhere and you live there and then you move away from it and then you go back but you don't quite belong there you don't quite belong where you move to you know i i do you know that there'll be a sense of that which is very much what he's feeling in the book you know he's been away in australia for 10 years and then he comes back and he feels like he, he's a ghost in his own town or he doesn't quite you know and the town has moved on and everything's moved on and how people see him has moved on um, because he used to be the great, you know, Scobie, one Kenobi, the great, he, you know, weekend, hard drinking, womanizing, all of that. Uh, and now he, he's not that and people don't. He, and so his sense of identity is completely kind of. So I suppose when I go back to Eaton Dairy, I suppose it's about home. Where is home? You know, and I and I still feel that Eaton Dairy is home in a funny kind of way. You know what I mean? And I don't recognize a lot of it now myself. Do you know what I mean? It's it's. It's changed so much, and um, but people are broadly very good to me, and very nice to me, and very kind of you know, really really like what I've done, and are great you know supporters of of the writing and the shows and the, all that kind of thing, you know. So that makes me feel good. But yeah, the a sense of where one belongs, I suppose, is because I've never owned a house myself. <laughs> Or I can't try. I've never done anything adult that you're supposed to do. Um, but um, so until until that happens, and we're, until I'm rooted somewhere else, you know, which I hope to be soon, that that I'll have a home away from home. But at the moment, it's it's uh, I'm a bit um, I'm home and I feel it's my home, but it's not it's it it's not it's not my home. If you know what I mean, you know. Yeah, I do. I do. It's a it's a big theme. Um, Belonging in general. Belonging, yeah. Another big theme in the book I sensed was uh, navigating what we might deem to be modern masculinity and the changing landscape around that and the lads trying to still be lads, but knowing that the scene has changed and there are certain things, quite rightly, that just aren't cool anymore. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Uh, well, we just, you know, it's, 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 it's kind of, it's, it was a great area because it's, you can have a bit of crap, you can have fun with it in a way. And uh, it was the lighter kind of, you know, banter in the, in the pub with Scobie and, and the lads, the building site and stuff that w- would have been in the original shows. I mean, there was stuff that we said in 2005 that now would no way would you be allowed to say it on TV. Casual kind of misogyny, you know, everyday casual kind of in the pub misogyny. That I think is the truth of the way certainly young fellas spoke then and probably speak now, but they'd just be more careful now about what they'd say because so in order and that's the big question we're talking about earlier. So to represent and to do the drama properly, those guys needed to say that. You know, I had to write the scene like that because that's the truth of of what they would say. And if I if I feel I can't write that now, then I feel that's a problem. But I don't want to be encouraging misogyny either you know what I mean so you're in a kind of a but but for me it's the truth of the drama wins out like because I'm all writers are kind of selfish like that you know, we don't give a bollocks really about <laughs> I mean well we do but like we our our first priority if we're really being honest is about the drama and the truth of the drama what's that, what's going to make that work do you know but you have to be responsible as well of course but so the, the, I mean there was a line and I was on a two Johnnies, the two the two guys who do that thing on um, radio, that their own podcast. I was did was on their show there a couple of weeks ago, and they picked this clip out as a as an example of something that absolutely could not be said now. So that we referenced that in the book. Do you know what I mean? That I, I've referenced this 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 line, and one, the, one of the lads says it, and the other fella says who's who's who has a younger niece or whatever says oh geez you can't be saying that lads anymore my niece told me it was unacceptable to be saying that and the boys get annoyed with him and then so they have this kind of debate about what what's what so i can't you're going to censor what i say in the pub i can't speak and blah 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 and it's just it's confusing for people so i suppose it's one thing for people to, it, it's it's like uh you know rules of the road or whatever like it's, it's one thing to have a, a rule of the road but to sort of know why it's there and to actually embrace it rather than to have it imposed upon you. Yeah. I, I suppose the danger is that there, there's some people just never going to come around to 
not being violent or dangerous or discriminatory or whatever it is. But I suppose the ideal or more meaningful path to cultural change is that everybody comes along on the journey. And rather than saying you can't say that, they, they actually know why you wouldn't say that. Yeah. And it's 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 context as well about like like if you have someone you like saying the same thing but but it but in a most kind of um really meaning it and 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 being full of hate and being full of bile and being full of you know that's completely like you like anyone would tell them to stay quiet if i mean the the, the other thing is if someone's using the same language but it's very casual it's very it's just it's just a way of talking and it's the way lads like to be seen in front of each other and they all feel they have to be talking like that. I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be on their backs. I wouldn't demonize them. But you'd want to bring them along and you'd want to be trying to encourage them that, you know, if we all keep talking like this, it's just not helpful for, for the world. Do you know what I mean? Like, it's just not helpful because you're, you're demonizing one half of the human race as being whatever. You know what I mean? This would be sexist language I'd be talking about. I would be, this is not race. We, the line we're talking about was was kind of misogynistic stuff rather than racist or you know but but some lads then feel that that, that are using it kind of lightheartedly but they feel everyone's coming down on them like uh, with a ton of bricks and then they, then they get annoyed at that and then they say i'm going to fuck it, but i'm going to fucking use it more now you know what i mean like it again it polarizes people more than as you're saying to get people to kind of understand the rules of the road and then bring them along with it you know yeah but it's difficult it It is difficult because, I mean, I think that slow and intentional road tends to last longer and, and have more sort of uh, buy in. Um, on the other hand, like, you know, society has always evolved sometimes in fits and starts. And sometimes there's a flare up to s- where there's an outpouring as th- as there was recently, you know, around sort of. Uh, landlordism in, in, in Irish politics and there's a big flare up, right? And and certain people say, well, that's lashing out at one individual or one system. But but they become these expressions of what we're no longer prepared to accept. And so I suppose if we were just kind of lashing out and flared up all the time, it's just a an unholy mess. Yeah. But it's the dialogue that needs to take place around that to expand and explore and i suppose it's one of the reasons i have a podcast is that i felt conversations were just being wedged into five minute ten minute bites on the radio and where do we get to as you say just like you say you can explore through drama then conversations another way yeah because it, on radio now, it's 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 you bring two people on different points of view. You get them flared up so that they really disagree with each other, and it's clear thing or whoever's on it, and they duck, 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 and then they talk over each other, and someone says something mildly outrageous, and then it's over in five minutes. You know. Oh yeah, completely. The five minute thing being the problem, like you know, being the problem, but and no one's listening to each other. You know what I mean? It's it's. Um, and it's it's just I've given up listening to it. To it. There's no point. It's just it's just the same. And actually, they could be arguing about anything. What they're arguing about like gets lost. The, you know, it could be potholes on the road, or it could be you know um, the housing crisis. That they're both given the same. That they're you know. Yeah, I I tend to share that view. It it feels like we've ended up in a sort of a Jerry Springer style discourse that is not a discourse. Well, it's not too far away from it, to be honest. Uh, you know, but 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 this being part of the issue in that that's public service media and surely has a remit to create those forums yeah. to explore the national underbelly, if you like, or overbelly. And we've it's been sort of deduced, reduced, reduced down to this lowest common denominator stuff. So where are we going to end up is in polarities anyway, because it's feeding off polarities. Yeah, and people and people like to be activated in that way, so they tune in more and tune in more. And like I, I will do it as well. You, you're you're kind of sometimes you're attracted to the to the the thing that you disagree with. You get activated by that, and you want to see more of it because you want to, or you want to feel self righteously kind of above people or something. You know, I think that's you know the likes of Trump get so much coverage because he's so outrageous and so appalling. It's easy to disagree with him. There's no there's no thought about it. It's it's just. 
it's easy to be outraged or something. But yeah, it's it's sugar, isn't it? It's feeding it's feeding the sugar. We're 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 addicted to this easy kind of hit that makes us feel good for or or gives us something, activates us for a few minutes and then dies away again. And then we need more of it, and then we need more of it, and then we need more of it. You know, and the media will keep giving us more. <laughs> you know, they have no problem. Yeah, and and I suppose the dan- the ultimate danger is it can embolden populism and it kind of rips out the heart and soul of what traditionally keeps communities a bit more cohesive and, and together. Yeah, well, it's, it's, it's because it's again, you, you're saying the short message, you know, it's that short, those really weird movements that have, you know, grown up around Europe and all around the world, really. Now, Ireland, we don't really have one like that kind of right wing kind of weird kind of population make America great, make Ireland great again, whatever, renew or whatever they're called. But that all flowers in that short message. Just keep repeating the simple message again and again and again. I think that um, Goring used to say it for the, the Nazi head of propaganda. You've, you've one very clear message, simplistic thing, and you just keep repeating it, repeating it, repeating it. And eventually it would become people will start to believe it. And, you know, it definitely helps that. No, no, there's no debate. There's no um, complexity. Yeah, I think there there have been attempts of it. And I suppose the make Ireland great again thing doesn't quite wash because it, it, it's it's unclear what era they're sort of harking to. Is at the time of Cúchulainn when we were, you know, but I suppose there is an ongoing attempt at, you know, suggesting that now Ukrainians or before Nigerians, they, they were all the source of our woes. And I mean, like there, there, there is always going to be cohort that wants to find a, a, a single blame solution. But I, I think that's to some extent to our credit as a country that we do still strive on the whole, not always for some degree of civility. Oh, I think so. I think it's because we're smaller, smaller population. I think that makes it easier. But I do think it's still, there is still a good sense of community here, certainly, you know, around the country. There is still a sense of belonging. People still feel that it's good to help your neighbour. Although that kind of decency seems to be quite strong here still, you know. And long may it continue, Eugene. And long may it continue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's lots of, so many amazing people who just, um, keep it all going, you know? Well, listen, we, we're going to wrap up shortly, but um, I do want to, you know, <laughs> you have too many things to promote, to be honest. <laughs> what a sell? No, I'm not. I mean... Uh, we didn't get talking about most of it. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's, that's good. I mean, the thing, the, 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 um, yeah, who knows what will happen with these things, you know? And so I'm just glad to be getting them out there and uh, we'll see what happens. Yeah, I suppose that would speak to th- that your time in the trenches that you've reached that stage where you you're just prepared to roll and enjoy as you go now. Oh yeah, absolutely. And you never know what's going. You never know how things going to be. You know, no one knows nothing or whatever. William Goldman, the great Ameri- uh, Hollywood screenwriter, he said that about the film business or anything. James, nobody knows nothing. You just don't know when you put something out there, it could die a death or people could think it's the best thing ever. So you, you just don't know. The great joy is being able to, you know, see the, see the thing out there. And you know, you know, you know yourself that, that you've that had that experience of seeing your book in, uh, in a shop or it's just amazing holding, holding the thing like, you know, so uh, I'm looking forward to that experience of just seeing it in, you know, seeing it in a shop and, and, I'm really excited about about the play Heaven and just seeing that on its feet. And, and um, so there's lots kind of to look forward to. That's always a great blessing. It's a golden era, Eugene. It's a golden era. I don't know how long it'll last. So I'm going to enjoy it while it, 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 it. Absolutely. But no, I feel I feel good and I feel I have lots of kind of new stuff. I'm planning new projects that, you know, I get back into it at the, at the end of the year. So I just feel it's burning bright, whatever it is in the in the inside, you know. Mm. Onwards, more power to you. Onwards, yeah. Well, thanks for the chat. It was lovely. Thank you so much. Thank you, Rory. Thank you, Eugene. Good luck with all the great work. Thank you. Bye bye. 
Hello, Rory here again. Thanks for listening and thanks to Eugene for sharing his stories and his insights. Do check out his work where you can and share this episode if you know someone who might enjoy it. If you want to support the Love and Courage podcast, you can chip in on a once off or a monthly basis over at loveandcourage.org. Huge thanks to all you existing patrons. And you can find me, Rory McKiernan, on various social media platforms and at rurymckiernan.com. If you're new to the podcast, do check out the archives, some great conversations in there. Thanks again for listening. Until next time, here's to the work of creating a world of more love and courage.